Uh, yes. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to give, give, this, um, give this talk here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by, I'll try to explain why this kind of topic would be of interest in, in machine learning or otherwise. Uh, I'll do that by a quote. This is Bernhard Schoelkopf, he's one of the most quoted researchers in machine learning and he, he states here the well-known story about chocolate and, and correlation between chocolate consumption and, and Nobel Prize winners. And then um, says that, well, and this is of course nonsense, but the nonsense depends on that you make no, make no causal uh, assumptions because you cannot, you cannot sort of uh, I increase the level of scientific production by feeding people with chocolate, that's quite obvious. So he means that to understand, to really understand things, you have to understand um, causality, and in particular, the, the thinking about interventions. Now, causality, it's a, it's a long topic and, and has been studied by lots of different people, um, amongst foremost philosophers, and nowadays it's also sociologists and, and, um, and people in epidemiology, and, and, a, and then, in addition, of course, artificial intelligence. Um, the, the, what everybody quotes as the first thing about causality is, is the definition by David Hume. And Hume's definition can be, can be sort of like his definition of causality has this kind of, right from the beginning, it has a, it has a counterfactual thing. Namely, Hume says that if, if the first object is a cause, if it had not been, the second never had existed. That's his, th therefore, therefore, the first one is, is, a, is a, um, uh, a cause. So right from the beginning, he introduces the counterfactual thinking. As, as, as I uh, well, m my theory is that he should have said, if cause had not been, the effect had probably had never existed. That's the probabilistic theory of causality. I, I, will, not, I will not sort of like, I, I'm, I'm not qualified to do much of... Uh, survey of these philo philosophers thinking that's quite a lot of it and, and extremely sophisticated. But there's one problem with them. They never produce a single formula. We should put numbers into I mean, uh, they, you, you, can, you, can, you can read pages and pages of, of definitions and theorems, but there's not a number. I mean, I come from the tradition in statistics where you put a number into probability. So I'll, I'll try to put a number here now instead of, instead of qualifying myself with a with this, with the philosophy. Uh, basically, the way I ever got into thinking about these things that we're talking about today is that I, I was working in a, in a, or, or with a, with a peop, group of people in, in clinical uh, physiology at Karolinska Institute where these things, some of these things appeared, or the mathematics here sort of like is, did appear. This is joint work with Daniel Barilund, he's a student of mine. Uh, much of what I'm saying here, I, we somehow came to do during this last few weeks. So this is not something that I have, not a talk I have given a couple of times before, not even something that's been published. I mean, it's the first time ever I, I presented this. So here I start now. My, my point is, is I, I will be completely committed to this one thing, the diamond deck. This is a, this is a, now the, your the only only sort of like um, software for these graphs that I found GIMP produces very pure arrows. I mean, it's supposed to be an arrow from here to there. You can you can get it as an arrow, but this, so some, something is wrong with the software. But anyway, it's supposed to be a, an arrow. I later on I remove this <coughs> particular impediment here. So this is that these are uh, these are uh, um, nodes and they correspond to random variables like. Uh, X1 and X2, they are, they are something that lie intermediate between A and D. D here is, is basic, everything here is, 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 is binary except A. A can be discrete or binary, it doesn't matter. And basically here we have the, the interpretation here is that D is, a, is, a, is something like the emergence of a disease. One, you, 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 you get the disease from some exposures, X1 and X2, or not. And that's the, that's the simple thing. Now, now, probability comes into, comes into um, being here by the fact that we 
introduce a so joint distribution for, for, these, for these four variables, the diamond deck. And, well, you, you probably all know this. Uh, and that, the trick is that you factorize it so that, that this, the probability distribution here depends only on the, is conditional only on the nearest, on, on its, on its uh, direct parents and so on. That's the factorization thing here. So now the question is, what has this got to do with causality? Uh, well, it's not just a pro pro probabilistic graph or something. Now, the usual answer is the following, that there's an interpretation. And it's a nice interpretation, namely that, you see, somehow the influences here go from, uh, let's say that this is the, the it's kind of re re elementary time there. First things happen here, then things happen here, and then finally things happen there. So time goes from left to right. Uh, then there's the possibility of, of propagating in, uh, inter intervention, and they only go downstream. So intervention here doesn't influence what happened before. It only influences what, what happened afterwards. And then there is the, 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 the presumption that, that or the, the claim that there is a, you can do counter, counterfactual inferences. So in some sense, <laughs> I don't know, I've been teaching this thing quite a lot, and every time I feel a bit of, of, of fraud when I come there and say, well, this is a, it's, a, it's an interpretation of causality. So in some sense, you say, you're saying here that these are models for causality because they represent causality, therefore they are causal models. I mean, this, but I don't know. Anyway, anyway now I'm, 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 I'm about this, going to be talking about this counterfactual algorithmization. Algorithm isn't mine, I'm, it's a slight modification I've done, namely, I don't use any of these structural equations like that are used by Judy Apur, who has invented this counterfactual algorithmization. There are three points, evidence up, update, and counterfactual intervention, and then there's prediction. And first step, evidence update, it simply is that, means that you, 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 you see, you, you know that that you observe the state of one of the variables. Like you say, you see that, that the x2, sorry, x2 there has a certain value. And then you update your distribution by simply calculating the, the, the joint distribution of the, uh, the conditional distribution of the, of the variables given the, um, your observations. And simple mathematics now gives you well, definition of conditional probability gives you something that looks like this. And here you have sort of like the update of the evidence. Namely, it is the conditional distribution of A given what, what happened there in X2. So, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of natural because things happened here and that information will, will give us some sort of information about the state there. So I'm going to update the, update the probabilities down, down there at the parent level. So that's where we got into. Now, now we make the counterfactual intervention. And this is the counterfactual thinking. So we know, we know that a certain state is true out there in, the, in X2. And then we, then, we, then we do the counterfactual negation. Namely, we, we, we flip the bit from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. So if, if the world, world the state of the world was actually X2 is 0, then we make the counterfactual operation that actually x2 is 1. And then, then we are sort of like that the purpose is to calculate, um, sorry, uh, calculate probability distribution of the variables given these two things. Now these you see, I mean, in terms of co conventional probability, that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, you can't, you can't at the same time condition on the thing happening and not happening. That's, that's not possible in the, in the probability calculus that we teach to our students at the, at the, uh, at any probability course, actually. And now, but now, now the point here is that, that I can, I can sort of like insert, here I got, I've evid this, I, I simply just insert my counterfactual state of mind or world here in that particular, there's a, there's a room for insertion. So I put the counterfactual operation there. So here we, here we, have, now, here we have now a probability that here is the counterfactual um, 
in the intervention, the old world, where actually the truth is the, the opposite, is represented by this evidence down there. So in, in, in that particular way, you have sort of like both of these things in one, one, one formula, because the, um, you have updated it, but then you have changed everything else there. There's an alternative way of doing this, namely that, and then prediction, you can sort of like, uh, then you calculate the counterfactual probability by marginalizing out the, all the rest of the variables. What I was about to say is that uh, here, actually, that you can also, you can also think of this as you start, you started with this kind of distribution, and then you do the, you, you make what's known as the do calculus on it. Namely, you, you, you divide this thing here, and then evaluate everything at the, at the negation. And then you get exactly the, the formula that I was, I, was to, I was talking about here. The do calculus, I'll, I'll, I'll show you do calculus later on in, in some examples. It simply means that you do a surgery here. You, I, I mean, you, you remove one of the edges, the edge from A to X2, and that's the do calculus. And then evaluate everything else at the counterfactual value. The operations are simple, in fact. It's not, it's not a... Now, the question here is, again, how to, how, to, how to advance from this particular step here. I mean, this is, well, you may accept it or not, but still, it's, it's not much of a, much not much of a, of a, of a, of a, of a rule for doing anything. You have to figure out some other way of, so now, I'll, 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 what I'll do here, and this is, this, this is a special trick here now, namely, I'll, I'll make an assumption about, about the, well, I, I make a model for these, um, these particular distributions. And that's what I, I get my, what I'm calling the noisy logical distributions. And the noisy logical distributions, they are, they are rather, they, it's a, because I can, for, we take an alpha now, as a function of, of two binary variables. And then, then, then you introduce this, actually, these omegas. Now, omegas are sort of intermediaries here. X's are my influences, omegas are inter intermediaries. And then you sum this, let's say that delta is one. Then you sum these things over all binary values such that this alpha is one, or the, that the proposition is true. Now this, this, is, uh, this, is, um, this particular thing was suggested, and I'm not quite sure, it doesn't matter who was the first one, but you can find it in the paper by David Heckerman and and Brees, John Brees, I think, in IEEE system, uh, IEEE um, uh, systems and, and whatever. And th th this paper is, is, is mathematically probably most complete or the most um, extended or, or, uh, by, 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 by Peter Lucas. He has also written about how to learn these this uh, this uh, noisy none of these uses the word noisy logical function it's been introduced later on by some other people so that's that's not, that's now my trick now how and you might un wonder how how this would help us from the get further there now here is the here is sort of like the here is sort of like the 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 image of it this is also a a, a Bayesian network now here the it's turned upside down but alpha here sort of like collect in this, here are the, the, the sort of the influences or the, and, 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 or the exposures, intermediaries, some sort of media as a technique, all independent, etc. An alpha collective sort of produces an interaction between these, between these things. So now, now, point is that if I have if I have alpha Boolean function of two variables, I have sixteen possible. Uh, Boolean uh, noisy logical distributions, and now I mean it's it's not impossible to to work out what this sum is, you know, in each and every one of the cases. So you, you have an, and for example, if if alpha is the OR function, Boolean OR, then you are go, then you are going to get this thing here, which is known as the noisy OR. I mean here is a yes, it's completely comprehensible function. Now, I, I, when I was preparing this, I was wondering how, how could I now argue that this is of anything importance to anybody. And uh, it was a very strange thing. Uh, then I suddenly remembered this particular paper, drug-drug um, interaction surveillance. 
Oh, yeah, remember, this is, the, uh, this is a part of the thesis of, of Niklas Nuren, who's the first author there. And I, I, and I know that I was, I, was the, I was the opponent on this thesis. It was in Stockholm University. I'd all, all forgotten the whole thing. But then I, and now, if you look at this paper there, they, 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 they introduce these kind of probabilities. There. There's a P00, P01, P, and so on and so on. Now, if you, if you just... Actually, what they are doing is that they are looking at noisy ore with in, of, of three binary variables. So the same mathematics that I showed you provides you this thing here. Then they fix this always at the level level one. And then they make a change of variable, and then they get something that that actually is this thing here is the the, the noise of this thing is the leaky noisy ore. Because the point here is that if there is no exposure, then you you still got a positive probability to, to say to get the disease, even if so. You have a bad luck, or there is some sort of unknown uh, environmental or, or background causes for. That's different. So, so, and, and you see, this is uh, this this is exactly what they are what they are doing there. So, actually, they had noisy ore here, leaky noisy ore. I didn't realize it at the time when I was opposing. I know I'm sure they knew, but anyway, that was leaky noisy ore. So there you see, that's a, the the stuff there is the. But they are really doing this drug drug. I mean, what they are doing is that they, they study um, reports about, about adverse, uh, adverse effects, drug effects. Coming, they, there's this, there is this uh, H, uh, World Health Organization col, 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 Collaborating Center for International Drug Monitoring. So they study from all of the world reports about, about adverse effects, namely things that, I mean, you have r reports about people getting various kinds of drugs and then something, they get uh, some sort of disorder or, or something like that. And then they try to figure out when this is um, really something to, to be alarmed about. It's, it's, big, it's a big computer science activity, in fact. I mean, they get 40,000 reports per month and put it in the database. And then they try to find cases where there are, there are lots of these adverse effects. Okay, forget it. Now, this noisy ore and leaky noisy ore, they were, they were the very things that you can see in, you can see in if you read the old book by Judy or Pearl. Put the, I put it here mainly for the, for, to put some color into my presentation. So now, what, what sort of like, um, this, is, this is now uh, the, may sound fancy, but it's really simple. We, we, we do this by, now we, now we write this by, by a Fourier transformer, Fourier series. It's a fancy thing because it's not really Fourier. Uh, there's another color thing. Uh, this, is a, this is a nice book about Boolean functions and uh, in, 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 uh, it's been used in, 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 in theoretical computer science partially. So here is the thing, I mean, that I, I put this in D to get it done. So actually the point is that you take, you, take, you, have, this, you have here the, you have here the index set. Uh, and take arbitrary subset and then define this function by, by multiplying, by taking the exponent of minus one with the corresponding x in, 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 in that thing uh, like that. Now this turns out to be an orthogonal basis for, for functions of, of x, of d Boolean variables. And therefore you calculate the coefficient with respect or the function with respect to its orthogonal basis and then you can re rewrite your function of x like that. So the point here is that I can, I can, of course, I can using this formula, I can regard my, by my noisy logical distribution as a function, as a generalized Boolean function of two binary variables, and by my, by this particular thing, I, I will then get, I will then, and in, in in this case, when I got two, I will get something that looks like that. So then, it, just to work out these things, and then to make changes of variable, and then it turns out that, actually. Any of these, any of these um, Boolean functions or noise logic distributions can be written like that. Where that's uh, always one or zero. That's that particular. Wait a minute. Well, I mean, you, you, you get a complete expression for all of these. Some of them are zero at, at some point. Some of them are not zero, negative or positive. So this, the, every one of them looks like that. In fact. Um, so now you see, I just simply, I use that thing there in that particular situation. I mean, I, it's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an obvious thing to use now. 
you're going to get you're going to get much more. And then, in fact, suppose that you are now in this situation where you where you intervene that x two, then you get this kind of thing to as your um, counterfactor probability. Now here it is. This is actually a formula. No matter if it may not be this or that, but it's a formula. It's for counterfactual probability. Not not a not a fancy philosophical um, notion, but there you could you could put numbers to it. And there you see that is the oh sorry. That's the that is the influence of the of the of the true world or the world we actually actually that was true when we have now intervened with this particular thing. Okay, I will not I will not so now now in order to see what this means you, you probably have to take a look at the look at some sort of simple examples. And there's one Boolean function. I mean this is simply it maps maps the the, the pair to the first first function there. So this zero one like that. In epidemiology, this is seen as a, uh, a antagonism or something like it. Namely, in this case, the exposure x1 completely masks the x2, uh, overrules the ones there. So the formula here, the intervention formula, is rather simple here, of course, because the Fourier, Fourier transform is also simple. It looks like this. Everything else vanishes. And that, in some sense, so it simply means that you are sort of like you, you are, you are, you are, this particular probability is multiplied by the probability of one given the update of your information. Um, I'll get back to that later. If you, if you intervene in X1, you get a, a symmetric formula. And um, if you do that intervention, you get this particular probability. Now, this is kind of simple because if you intervene at x1, then you actually remove all the influences. You have only from x1 to d, and there the counter actually is either 0 or, or 1 minus q1 in this particular case. Now, you could also intervene both of them, which simply means that, that um, you remove the, any influence from a in, in the graph. I do this only for the sake of the following point that then, then you simply you end up with simply substituting these counterfactual operations in your, in your formula for, for, the, for the outcome given these exposures. And in, in, some, in some, some of this literature, this is the, the example of the what's known as the consistency, namely that if you if you sort of like the, the, the outcome is the same, if this, if this particular thing happened for natural causes, then the probability of D1 is the same when it happened when we are sort of like um, intervening. That's not necessarily always true, but in this case it's sort of like mechanistically true because I'm, I'm just sort of inserting here. Okay, if you do this for noisy or then you end up with, with this thing here. If you intervene in both of the exposures, you end up with this, which is not surprising but in some sense this what happens here is that there is a uh, it recodes the 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 exposures like that and that's that this this discussion about the recoding is medical medical uh, clinic uh, epidemics there's a there's an issue about this thing here okay I, I know nothing about this but I found this on the in Wikipedia namely namely about um, there's some sort of book about cause and effect in Buddhist literature. Why this is important is that these paintings are regarded as some of the most important of specimen of Japanese art during the 8th century. I don't know how to interpret the picture in terms of, of cause and effect, but uh, again, just to put color to this. So now, 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 I come, now I come to my probabilistic causality thing. Uh, uh, there's a I, 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 no, in fact, I, uh, there was no cause in this actually at all, exposures and effects. But now I say that, that C is a cause of E, so X is a cause of D. If the counterfactual probability of E given C is greater than probability of E. Now here, this is, a, this is due to a philosopher from the univer ah, University of Lund, Salin. And here he talks about this. This is the philosophical way of saying, considering a restricted set of possible worlds, those and only those what we see holds, 
and which are most similar to the actual world. This is really the, one, of the, one of the ideas of philosophy, that, that sort of like the, you, by counterfactual, you move into a different world that's supposed to be as similar to your world you're living as possible, but nobody, nobody ever gets the recipe on how to find that world, what, where the, what the difference is, or what, what is the distance with our world with some counterfactual world. And in that sense, this algorithmization does the job as you have seen. I mean, it's a, we don't find, we just insert in a formula, right? So now, now you would sort of like, it would seem that you would, you would sort of like say that you, put, you calculate this ratio, and if this is larger than one, then you would say that the counterfactual, counterfactual um, in event is, is a cause. Well, at least we, have, we are now got the definition of a cause. Not, not, not saying that this is cause because this is causality, but this is the definition, check this ratio, and then you got, then you got your, your sort of, uh, you know what is a cause. Um, so that, that we know how to calculate. There's, that might be, a, I mean, the question, is, the question here is the calculate where the, uh, this is the overall probability of E. Now this is, now I, what I do here is that I calculate this thing using the same, same in, in, interaction function. I could, I could argue this in terms of this, this epidemiology, namely that every alpha I corresponds to a subpopulation of people who have this particular way of responding to this exposure. So I'm only looking at that subpopulation, therefore I can calculate this probability of disease using only that particular thing. At least that, that gives me another way of reducing the problems into formulas, not into, into um, designs. And so let's try this thing here, like that, the simplest example. So let's see if this makes any sense. So here I can calculate, I, I did calculate that earlier on this, wait a minute, PD1 is simply like this. So we are actually here, we actually, ah, there it is. There it is, the PD1, and there it is, that, that we calculated earlier. So we're actually looking at this ratio here. Uh, or more or less, we are looking at, in fact, the probability of, the joint probability of D, D1 and X1, one, and comparing with the updated probability. So obviously, I mean, in some sense, some sense, this is not, although it satisfies the, you can find, you can now say that if this is bigger than one, okay, then we have a cause. But in some sense, there is no causality here. This is, this has to be some, in some sense, a spurious case of causality. Because if you look at the, now here I'm overcoming the difficulties of, of, of GIMP, I'm, I've done it myself. So here you see, I mean, this was the, in this particular, it's not really a diamond, because X2 had no way of inter, inter, influencing D here. And if I now do this do calculus, I remove this thing here. So anything that happens here is actually independent of, has no influence whatsoever. And that's what we see in the formula. I mean, there is no, there is no counterfactual intervention there at all. So in some sense, there, in this case, it's only a matter of comparing these two, the probabilities of these two parts, actually probabilities of, of this thing here. Now, now you could say that, okay, then I have really proved that this edge is a cause or causal influence, but, but in some sense there is no causality here because the, that particular edge has been completely removed from the, in this, in this due operation. Doesn't matter what happens there, it's, uh, it doesn't influence the ratio of causality, so I don't know. However, there was a, in, in somewhere amongst the philosophers you have one of the towering personalities, Patrick Suppers, he's, was professor of philosophy at Stanford, and somewhere in 1970s he produced the theory of, of, of causality, saying that in this case, if this is true, then X is a cause of, of X1. That was his, I mean, assuming now that, that X2 happened before X1, that X2 has positive probability, that then the prima facie a cause of... of um, of x1, x0 is a prima facie cause. You see, I mean, the condition, of, if you see it, know this, then the probability of, of this event increases. That's the same thing that we, we end up here, too, actually. But this particular thing is not really, I mean, it's not really causality. I mean, it's simply, um, well, maybe, but I mean, in this model, they are 
correlated exposures, right? So, okay, so, so in some sense, Sapper's definition of, of probabilistic causality was the first one, probably, one of the first, but it, it works in a, diff, in a strange way. But it completely agrees with, the sec, with my definition in this particular case. Um, so let's take noisy and. And here, here we can, here we see the, here we see the, the uh, logical noise distribution looks like this. And now you see, if you if you evaluate this for all possible combination of exposures, you, this looks like that. And then this is the Fourier transform, and you, you can see that they both agree here. And you also see the following thing, namely that if Q1 and Q2, if they go, to, if you put them equal to zero, then this is this is sort of like. One zero zero, which is the truth table of the of the and function. So the noisiness disappears if you if but the, so that is sort of like continuously. It's sort of like a continuous fussification of the and. And that so that that that's the way it looks like. This is a you can you can check all of these um, noisy logical distributions in this way, and you you get always the same phenomenon, namely that they it converges to the corresponding logical function without any probabilities. So here we, here we have another thing, and then, then, we can, then we can sort of like start calculating the, the intervention probability, which, which then boils down to this thing here. Right. It's this here. Right. What do you have done here? OK. And here is the overall probability of it. So you see they have, they have again, two, two, two terms or, or factors in common and then there's this difference between those two there. I mean, this is this is also. I mean, in some sense, this is this rather almost like you are. You don't really even need the probability to understand this because if, if you see it, if you see that in real world, this is like this is one, and then you you you, you make a you make this counterfactual thing and move it that zero state to zero. Well, then you see from this thing here that moving from moving from, from 1 to 0 produces 0. That's already from the deterministic dynamics of this thing. So you, it's, it's not surprising, but on the other hand, so in that sense, maybe the counterfactual the counter seems to make sense. Now, in this sense, you can see it. You can do some manipulations, and then you end up, for causality, you end up looking at this criteria. Now, these things here, of course, they could easily be calculated from, say, look at this. WHO database. You can calculate those things from the database. The probability of people that have been exposed to both some, some medicine or not, and so on. I mean, these are available. The whole work of this uh, Nicolas Nuren was, was based on the fact that he could calculate these things from this database. They are... Uh, okay. So here you, here you see, you could sort of like then, then in this case, if that's true by Sappers, then, then you could say that this is a cause of the event. But then on the other hand, I mean, it's, it's rather, if you look at already the truth table of and, it kind of looks obvious that that's the way it has to be. I mean, in this case, we, have, we, are, looking at the, we are looking at the operations. Here is the, here is the true, here is the world in a life's rest. And then I've intervened here updated, I, I've observed x equal to zero, I've updated my probability here, and then I have, I'm calculating the, the um, probability of this being one by removing all the rest of this. So that was, in this case, the, the do operation eliminates the influence between it, because of course I have forced my state here and then there is no, um, there is no influence, except that there was the update. R doesn't influence D via X2 anymore. And that's what you see in the formulas too. Okay, time to stop. I'll stop with something provo provocative, namely, namely this, as I said, the algorithmization of Perl, the, what I did here was, is due to Julia Perl, but then on the other hand, I, I don't use any, any structural equations. I don't understand them. But then um, in, the, in this paper, he says the following that 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 okay he says that well he says that his algorithm is great 
And then he says, the, finally, that it carries the potential of teaching robots to communicate in the language of counterfactuals. It eventually acquire an understanding of notions such as responsibility and regret, pride, and free will. Now, not everybody would agree that it's a good thing for, 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 for robots to acquire free will. And he expands that in the in, in, in next interview. This is from a, from a web magazine, Quantum magazine. Question, will it, be op- what, when, will it be obvious when robots have free will? And is, I think the first evidence will be if robots start communicating with each other counterfactually, like, you should have done better. Okay, thank you. We have time for questions. Yeah, it's, 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 automatically, not by hand, yeah, automatically, but you can, you can still do three. Uh, I've I, I managed to do four. I mean, if you, if you get more numbers, then you can sort of like start introducing these kind of blocks of, of, of bits, and then it becomes simpler because you can do blockwise computation, but I'm quite sure that nobody can do it for five already. I, mean, that's the, I can do it for D in some cases. I can give you a nice formula, but sort of like... Um, computer. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm quite, I'm quite sure that it, it sort of like it, it can be, can be done by somebody. But I haven't tried that. I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, the, the cap- capabilities for that. No. Right. Right. And I don't think any, it, anybody would sort of like finance a, a project like that. I mean, yeah. uh, but he, he sort of like he, uh, there, there, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show you, but because that would be, that's the, this, this Furiakov is a B three. That's known as, in, it actually turns out to be the same thing as the epidemiologist says, the um, interaction contrast. But Lucas calls it sort of like adi- uh, interaction synergy. So in a computer sense, the same thing has a different name, but it's exactly the same thing. But the synergy thing, he actually tries to compute in, the, in a general case, but he, for various functions. But he, he, he ends up... So, giving up in, in, in most cases. He, he can't do it by hand. So, yeah, you have a question. So, um, about the use of these Fourier transforms, couldn't you compute everything without Fourier transform form? So what's the use of it? Is it only like you get nice formulas and some some understanding? Yeah, that's or, a, or that is no, that but it's a, it, it, well, you, if you look at the Fourier formula, it's sort of like it's a <laughs> becomes sort of the, 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 the parameters and the, and the variables are multiplicative and additive. So it's sort of like if you if you can you can you can do it without the Fourier transform, but this much simpler. I mean, you, you get it immediately uh, using using that expression. It's uh, my, my, of course uh, you can do it, but then then uh, then I, I, I think that's the easiest way of doing it, at least in these cases and in any other cases. The Fourier transforms. I mean, if you read this book, I mean, it's a uh, <clears throat> There's this whole school about random bool, uh, uh, about the uh, analysis of, of network uh, analysis of of networks actually, and various kinds of theorems. The the great great man in this Fourier transform business is Johann Horstad from our department. Uh, he left actually computer science and joint mathematics, which sort of like raised our ranking in the <laughs> in our rankings by maybe 25 <laughs> something like that. So it's important to have a really famous man in your department. <laughs> Buy somebody from outside, them, if you can. Well, I'm, everybody's famous, but in, in, his, in his case, you really see, you could see the impact. I mean, that he quit computer science and joint math, and up we went, like a rocket. There's still other questions. Okay, so great, thank you.